Good evening. I'm Bob B. Eagle. I'm the Vice President for Advancement at the University of Rhode Island. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening for our Big Thinkers program. I want to uh, begin by uh, welcoming not just all of you who are here this evening, but all of the people who are watching this event, which is being streamed live uh, through our website at URI. For those of you who are watching us on the web, Boston, Massachusetts, the home of the Boston Red Sox. I can hear our alumni in New York booing me now. <laughs> this is the first of the Big Thinkers series with our new president, David Dooley, and therefore we are doing this live streaming, and it is also our intent to broadcast these programs live on November 19th from the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., and on December 1st from New York City. And we also last week have done two uh, streamings of the Honors Colloquium at the University, the Honors Colloquium Demystifying India. Uh, this is an annual event, uh, the Honors Colloquium, which has become a real signature event for the University, the Demystifying India a topic and theme has become a very popular and it's drawing large crowds both on the university campus and we're tracking the numbers and we know that it's drawing large crowds on the website. So uh, we are hopeful and we believe that tonight's program is probably also drawing a large crowd on the website and we welcome all of those we can't see but we know that you can see us. We believe that uh, the University of Rhode Island is the only institution of higher learning right now. If it's not the only, it's one of a precious few, but I'll say it's the only one because nobody can really prove me wrong here, uh, that is doing live streaming of public affairs programming. And uh, we believe that's proving the new URI brand, Think Big, because we clearly are thinking big. As you all know, about a year and a half ago, we introduced the brand to the university, Think Big, We Do. And that brand has been received very, very favorably from all of our stakeholders, ranging from prospective students and their families and current students, through alumni and through other people who have a real care and concern for the University of Rhode Island. As part of that brand, we introduced the Big Thinker series. And last year, we used the series to feature prominent alumni who were clearly big thinkers in their field and personified their alma mater, the university. This year, with a new president, we decided that we would have the Big Thinker series feature the new president and it's a way, first of all, for us to introduce him to alumni around the country and around the world via the live streaming. But it's also a way for us to show that not just alumni, but the university president as well as others are indeed big thinkers too. So it's my very great pleasure tonight to be able to introduce to you the 11th president of the University of Rhode Island, uh, Dr. David Dooley, who comes to us with a distinguished 30-year career in higher education. He holds an undergraduate degree in chemistry from the University of California at San Diego and a doctorate from the California Institute of Technology. He taught for a number of years at Amherst College and the experience at Amherst gave him, among other things, deep New England roots, as well as deep Boston Red Sox roots. And I have to point out, I can't let this opportunity go by, that on Friday night, October 1st, the 2nd, October 2nd, the last weekend of the baseball season, 
President Dooley will be throwing out the first pitch at Fenway Park. That'll be a great night for the Red Sox, and it'll be a great night for URI, and it will also be a great night for the President. After leaving Amherst, he went to Montana State University, where he served as department chair for a number of years, and then became the provost and vice president for academic affairs. He is credited for many things at Montana State, including having led MSU into the top tier of American research institutions. He also effectively chaired the university's budget planning and assessment committee. During that time, he continued with his own professional research, much of it funded by the National Science Foundation. And I want to point out that even with his presidency at URI, where he's working 24 hours a day, he's still finding time to continue with his research project at Montana State. He is actively in, involved in scientific discovery and research. Dave Dooley comes to URI with a reputation as someone who has a collaborative leadership style. He believes in reaching out to others and effectively engaging them in decision making, in policy development, in priority setting, and in partnerships. He also has a deep commitment to transparency and accessibility. As a manifestation of his interest in being accessible and in keeping open the lines of communication, he's become a blogger. This is the first presidential blog at URI, and I hope that you're reading it religiously. Uh, he's writing a new blog at least once a week. Uh, we're getting a great response. I think it's also fair to say that he's having a lot of fun doing it. His appointment at URI has excited the campus. Students, faculty, staff are pleased with his selection and eager to work with him. So are our external friends and partners, and he's been very, very actively engaged in speaking to and talking with many of the stakeholders around Rhode Island in the few short months that he's been here. President Dooley is married to Reverend Lynn Baker Dooley, a Baptist minister. Most recently, while in Montana, she served as a hospice minister in Montana, and I'm very, very pleased that she's with us tonight. Lynn, if you'd like to stand up, and hopefully everybody's met her. And if you haven't, please do uh, when, when the evening is, is over. One of the changes that has already been made by Dave and Lynn is their usage of the president's house which they see as a center for campus life, and especially for entertaining and engaging students in a variety of events. And I think you may hear the president talk tonight somewhat about his view of students. The Dooleys have two grown children, Samantha and Chris, and they have a dog named Rhody. <laughs> so it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you our newest big thinker, the president of the University of Rhode Island, Dr. David Dooley. Bob, that was, a, as usual, a very eloquent and well done introduction. It always leaves me with two thoughts. One, as it increases in length, I then have to think, how am I going to talk for as long as you did <laughs> in the introduction? And secondly, you, you cause me to reflect every time you say it that I have a distinguished 30-year career in academia. That, 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 that's a nice ring, and I, and I appreciate very much the sentiment behind it. But I, I tend to hear distinguished less in 30 years more. <laughs> You know, really the desire would be to have a very distinguished 10-year career in academia. <laughs> 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 
but I, but you know I can't I can't say that because <laughs> I have been in it that long and and I've enjoyed every minute of it frankly um, and and we're enjoying URI since we've arrived here and we began the work every bit as much as I've enjoyed anything I've ever done and and that's an important statement for me because I, I can say I've been blessed over the years with with the kind of possibilities and the kind of opportunities that probably few people have. And uh, we've tried to make the best use of all of those and we've enjoyed it a lot, I, I have to say that. And every aspect of our time together, Lynn and I, and with our kids and in the various places that we've worked and served, we've enjoyed it. And never more so than at URI. So it's a special pleasure and privilege to be here tonight uh, speaking as a, as a big thinker, and um, I don't know how comfortable I am with that label, having n read about some of your other big thinkers, who I, I think, from my perspective, truly are great innovators, people who have done things that have really left a mark uh, in, in their chosen disciplines, and are well characterized as being a big thinker and a big innovator. Uh, you can decide whether or not I rise to that level. Uh, as we proceed through, the, through what I hope will be many years of working uh, together on behalf of the students and the faculty and the, and the people of the University of Rhode Island. What I do want to do tonight is, is two things. I will share with you some thoughts about the University of Rhode Island and its current context and its future. And secondly, to leave some time for questions, because I think your questions may be better than anything I could say. and so that would give me an opportunity to at least make a smart answer or an informed answer or maybe a dissembling answer to a very good question and that might be better than keeping on talking. So I want to leave time for that and I hope that you're prepared to ask some questions. It, it, we all know, everyone in this room knows, that in many ways these are very extraordinary times uh, for our nation, indeed for the world, and very extraordinary times for higher education and for the University of Rhode Island. I think, I can't think, except at the, the moments of great crisis in the world, when we have been so keenly aware of the magnitude of the challenges that we face. And what's different is the magnitude of the challenges that we face now are not really related to armed conflict. We have armed conflict, very troubling armed conflict in the world, and we have the ever-present threat of terrorism in the world. But I think we would agree that it doesn't rise to the magnitude of the cataclysmic conflicts that we faced in World War II, for instance, when indeed the future of the world did look, did, did look very, very doubtful and, and insecure. The kinds of challenges we face now are not related to that they might actually in the future be unfortunately the stimulus for those kinds of conflicts again if we're not able to deal with them appropriately now when we might have the window of opportunity to do so. But if we look at the future of the world and we look at a world that is incre increasingly globalized where all kinds of barriers on the one hand are coming down and on the other hand becoming ever more important, the barriers across culture and history and tradition and faith. Those are very, very important challenges to everyone. One can't help but watch a single session of the UN without thinking of the gulf that separates us from our common humanity and the differences that people bring to that location and argue about and talk about and, and promote and the challenges it means for all of us in higher education and in leadership and in our nation and in other nations of the world is to find a way forward through all of those differences, through all of those um, varied perspectives on how the grand challenges of the world should be dealt with. Because the diversity of the world in a globalized and flat world is in fact a challenge in and of itself. How do we deal with that? How do we train our young people to deal with that. Those are very, very important questions and one of the critical challenges that we face. And we add to that the challenges that we face around global climate change. And we may, we may wish to debate about the origins and magnitudes of very, various contributing factors to global climate change, but we can't argue about the fact that it's present and its consequences could be very, very serious for many parts of the world. 
was one of the points that was actually made in the first speaker in our honors colloquium on demystifying India, pointing out the fact that here is a country which on the one hand can justly say, given its history, it's contributed very little to the climate change that it's now facing. But on the other hand, it faces some of the most serious consequences of global climate change. And I think many countries are in that boat, and the United States is in that boat. We have to ask ourselves what kind of leadership are we going to provide or not in dealing with that challenge. And it's only one of many. We, we face the emerging challenge of infectious disease when growing resistance to pharmaceuticals and treatments that have been so successful for so long challenges our very assumption that we had in fact conquered disease in many cases. The global challenges around sustainability and energy are also large and looming because ultimately the limitations to global prosperity, to developing a standard of living that lifts everyone out of poverty and gives everyone, not just in the United States, but everyone the chance to have a life of the kind that we aspire to and many of us have led, sometimes for a long time already, uh, those, are, those are huge challenges. And the ultimate limit to that will be energy because energy drives so much of what we're capable of doing. How do we provide the world's ever increasing thirst for new energy sources and at the same time solve the problems of sustainability? So we do sit, I think, in extraordinary times in this nation, in this world, and in higher education. And, and what that leads me to do is think a lot about how you or I as an institution ought to respond to these times. Is it enough for us to continue to do the things that we have always done so well? And many of you here, our alumni, you're, you're a testimony. Your lives are a brilliant and lasting testimony to the quality of the education that you received at URI, to the quality of the institution, to the quality of the people who are there that you worked with and learned from. And it's a strong testimony, and it's, it's a very moving testimony, and it's a very important testimony. And, and we never want to lose sight of that. But nevertheless, we have to ask ourselves, and I think we should ask ourselves the question, if what we've done that produced such great outcomes in you is going to be sufficient for the future. And that's a hard question to ask because it, it, it asks people to step back and take a look at what they're doing and think about whether what they're doing should be continued. And that's difficult, especially if you know that what you've been doing, you've been doing at a level of excellence for a long period of time. But I think we need to do that in higher education. I think the University of Rhode Island needs to do that. And what I want to share with you is just some thoughts about that uh, tonight. Because ultimately, we'll need your help because this is not going to be the kind of transformation that's going to be accomplished solely by the people who are on the campus. It's going to have to be accomplished through the help of its graduates, its supporters, it, the, the state and local governments, its partners everywhere in order to, I think, achieve what needs to be achieved. What are some of the elements that I've been thinking about along these lines? Let me share those with you briefly. I think we need to in higher education, we need to get away from the common vernacular, which is now, I think, increasingly problematic, of thinking as of higher education as something that you buy and students as consumers. I think that's profoundly misguided. Even though many parents, for, for good reasons, and many students come to URI and they, they seem to have the attitude, we're here, it's costing us a fair amount of money to be here. Now, what are you going to do for us? What does our money actually purchase for us? We've paid it, we're entitled to something from you as a consequence of making that payment. And I think that's a deeply problematic way to look at higher education, and never more so now. Because in essence, higher education cannot be purchased. Higher education, education in general, has to be created, especially at the university level. And the people who do that creating are going to be the students themselves and the faculty they work with. And so what you're asking when you say, what are we going to get 
from coming to the University of Rhode Island is you're going to get the opportunity to make your future, to create your future, to create an education that will be the foundation for your future. And you're going to have the opportunity to do that with other students who, like you, want to create a good future for themselves and are motivated to do that. And you're going to have the opportunity to build that future with faculty who are there precisely for the reason to be oriented towards your success in building that, that future. And that's really the second thing that I want to, to lay out in front of you as a challenge for all of us in higher education, is our primary focus, I think, needs to be, and there are many things for higher education to focus on, but our primary focus needs to be, amongst everything else, the success of our students, to produce in our students the kind of testimonies that you already have. That needs to be the reason we come to work every day at the University of Rhode Island, is what are we going to do today that's going to help our students be successful? That's very much related to the question I posed to you earlier. Are the things that we have done in the past to help our students be successful still going to do that? And that's, I think, why we need to have a critical examination of that. If we're really all about the success of our students, then it is incumbent upon us to continually reflect upon what we're doing and ask ourselves the question about whether what we're doing is actually going to make our students successful or not, or help them be successful. We can't make them, we can only do our part. But we need to do our part enthusiastically, determinedly, and with, and with energy. And we need to do it consistently over time and not to waver from that as our primary focus. The third thing that I want to just sort of lay out for you as, as part of the context for higher education in the times in which we live is this notion that education in and of itself is something that occurs in certain confined spaces, classrooms and instructional laboratories, when in fact just listening to many of you tonight and the kinds of experiences that you've had and you've shared and talking to our current students at the University of Rhode Island, the truth is very evident those classroom experiences are incredibly valuable. In fact, they're indispensable. There are certain things you just have to know that have to be learned you know, from, by talking to someone who knows them better than you do and working with that individual and reading things and thinking about them. But there's a whole host of other things that cannot be learned that way, that are equally important. And so therefore, an education that consists only of a series of classroom experiences is not going to be the education that's going to serve our students well. And in fact, it hasn't been that kind of education for a very long time. Some institutions have just been slow to recognize what that means. And faculties have been slow to recognize what that means. We're comfortable doing what we've always done. And how we learned, we think, is the way that the next generation needs to learn. And I would say to you, that's, that's an assumption that has to be examined that the current generations are going to learn in the same way that we learned. That's assumption, I think, is probably fundamentally flawed. And that's another reason we have to rethink what we're doing. And what I would like to see at the University of Rhode Island, to be candid, is a discussion about how we structure the undergraduate curriculum and undergraduate coursework and undergraduate programs to create more times for students to do things other than take courses that directly contribute to their success. And I think that's an incredibly important task in front of us. We want to create more opportunities for students to be engaged in research and in creative work. We want to give our students the chance to grapple with questions to whom no one knows the answers, to look at phenomena for which there is no explanation, to create things that have not been created, to think about things that other people haven't thought about. We want our students to be able to do that when they're 18 and 19 and 21 and 22. As undergraduates, we want to give them those kinds of experiences. If we succeed at doing that, I believe the data suggests and experience suggests, your lives in fact suggest, that they will actually be better prepared, more successful, better capable of dealing with the grand challenges that face the planet and our nation and the world than if we gave them a curriculum that's entirely structured around three credit courses in classroom work. And so that's a question I've posed to the faculty and to the deans and to others at the University of Rhode Island. Let's take a step back and let's think about how to do that. But I've also said one other thing to them, and at this I'll wrap up and, and, and open it for question. 
No one in this room, and I've said this many times, I've not had any takers yet, so I'll pose it this way. Is there anyone in this room who, if we re-ran the race between the tortoise and the hare, would want to bet on the tortoise? Any takers? I have $100 on the hare. Okay, I've got one. Oh, two. Okay. Well, let me tell you why I think I would clean your clock and take your money. Let's face it, it's a great fable, a great fable, but that's all it was. I would posit to you in the 21st century, the race is not going to go to the slow and the steady. The race is going to go to the steady and the quick. And that's a reality that we're all going to have to deal with, is that the rate of change of our institutions is going to have to increase that we are not going to be able to do things and make the changes at the rates at which we're accustomed to doing them. It doesn't mean that we can't have rich discussions. It doesn't mean we can't be open and inclusive in thinking through the changes that we need to make in higher education. It doesn't mean that it can't be a process that richly involves people from outside the institution. But it does mean it needs to be a process that's far more expedited than we're used to. And the reason I believe that strongly is I, I look across the world and I look at the rate of change in the world and I look at the magnitude of the challenges that we face and the fact that they grow larger every day. Every day, these challenges don't diminish. Every day, these challenges become more serious. And therefore, preparing people to deal with them cannot be done at the pace and at the rates at which we're accustomed to doing it. I think we have to increase the rate of change, the rate of, of accommodation to the challenges and their impacts for, on us. And I think the challenge to an institution of higher education like the, like the University of Rhode Island is to say, okay, we understand where we need to go and we also understand we need to get there more quickly than perhaps we're comfortable doing, but we're ready to do it. And I think if we're successful at that at the University of Rhode Island, there will some, be some very, very positive outcomes. I think institutions that in times like these demonstrate that they are flexible, that they are responsive, and they are innovative are going to be institutions that quite honestly attract talent and attract resources. Because those are the kinds of institutions that I think people will intrinsically recognize are going to be the institutions that will help us solve the grand challenges of the planet. And that's where I want to position URI. I want URI to be known as an institution that is grappling with the big picture, that is taking on the grand challenges, that is preparing its students to provide solutions that the world needs, and it is doing that in a way that is responsive and flexible and innovative. I want us to be known most of all as an institution that's responsive and innovative. And I think URI has a great history of innovation and a great history of responsiveness and flexibility. It just needs to do more and it needs to do it faster in my judgment. And, and that's not a judgment that I make from the perspective of just saying, well, I want to win a competition or I want to win a race. That's really ultimately not what it's about. What it is truly about, I think, is preparing the next generations to deal with the world that they're going to find and the world that they're going to inherit. And we need to make sure that they're prepared as best as we can prepare them. And more importantly, that we prepared them how to think about the challenges that they think that they're going to face that we prepared them to be innovative, that we prepared them to think critically, to reason analytically, because then they can create the solutions that they will need to create to the problems that they're going to confront. And that's, I think, the mission and goal of the modern research university in the 21st century. And that's what I think is so much fun about being at a place like the University of Rhode Island because it gives you the opportunity to be a part of that even if you've been a part of higher education for 30 years, it's still fresh, it's still new, because the challenges are different, the challenges are more compelling, frankly, than some of the ones that we faced in the immediate past. And it's the young people in this audience, ultimately, they're going to have to grapple with the consequences of those challenges if we don't find ways to overcome them. And we think, I think, that the University of Rhode Island can actually be a leader in that process 
and not a follower, and that's what I want to see the University of Rhode Island be. So with that, I conclude my remarks. I hope that leaves us some time for questions and discussion. I would look forward to that very much, and thank you again for coming out tonight and for listening in. You know, that, that is a very interesting question, and <laughs> it's one that, that I find uh, uh, fascinating. Because on the one hand, you have a little over a million people in, in a thousand square miles, and you would think, how can you not be connected to everything in that kind of situation? How can people in that kind of context not understand that we are indeed all in it together for the state of Rhode Island. Uh, it should be easy, it seems to me, to build coalitions, to form collaborative teams, uh, to work together to solve the problems of the state and contribute to the problems of the nation and the world. Uh, and yet, I think there are, are times what Rhode Island's past would suggest that that's been very difficult. And, and I think Rhode Islanders, to some degree, I've noticed, and shared with people there very candidly, seem to carry around a little bit too much of the baggage of the past, I think. They, they don't seem to appreciate just how terrific a place it is, how fine a state it is, how good the university is, frankly. And, uh, and they almost seem to have the attitude of thinking, maybe these problems really are unsolvable and insurmountable. But I don't believe that. I wouldn't be here if I thought that even for a moment. Uh, I'm not in any way being dismissive of the, of the magnitude of the issues that the state faces. They're, they're significant and substantial, and, and I, I was dealing with that today before coming up here, talking candidly with the student senate last night about the budget problems that the state has and how, what that means for higher education and for University of Rhode Island in particular. And, and those are big challenges and they're difficult moments for us all. But is that a situation that we can't deal with? I don't think so, I think we can deal with it. Now there are various pieces that we have to get to bring together in order to be successful. Part of it, absolutely critically, essentially, is higher education. Rhode Island needs to understand, I think, very, very well, and I think many people do, that higher education is probably the best investment the state can make in a brighter future and that the University of Rhode Island can do things for the state of Rhode Island and for the nation that uh, you know, other institutions are not able to do inside the state and do them differently and, and, and contribute in unique ways. And I think Rhode Island, the University of Rhode Island is prepared to do that. And I'm, and I'm very optimistic about our success in doing that. And I understand very much the expectations on the university that we will step up to the plate and we will become a bigger economic driver for the state, that we will contribute more to the revitalization of the state's economy than we have even in the recent past. I think that all that's achievable. But I th what I would say to the state is even if URI does all of those things, that's not the complete puzzle, and we can't put the complete puzzle together unless we have all the pieces on the table, and that includes things like public policy questions and economic questions and social questions that the state has to grapple with. I think URI should be at the table because I think URI can bring a lot of expertise to dealing with those questions, both on its faculty and on its alumni, who would want to be a contributor to solving those problems for the state and for the nation. And I think that's, that's a very important contribution that URI can make. But we do have to work together. Now, I'm optimistic about that because it is, after all, a place which until today, as I said to the Northern Rhode Island Chamber of Commerce, until today, when I entered any destination in Rhode Island into the car's navigation system or into Google Maps, it never predicted a driving distance of more than 30 minutes. 
You know, for somebody who came from Montana, you know, that's like crossing the street. I mean, I remind you, Montana is the state where the diagonal northwest to southeast is the same distance as Washington, D.C. to Chicago, Illinois. That's Montana. When, you know, you can reach about any part of the state of Rhode Island from Kingston, it seems like, my gosh, we, all, we are all neighbors. Let's work together as neighbors. So I think there are some huge advantages that the state has by virtue of it, the diversity of its population, by virtue of the proximity and the community that exists, by virtue of the kinds of institutions that are in there. We just need to develop better ways of working together, working collaboratively, and realizing that we truly are all in it together in Rhode Island. And I think if we can do that, frankly, I think we'll amaze a lot of folks as to what we can accomplish. <laughs> I thought you might. <laughs> That, those are all very good points. Um, I would just continue to say that I do feel a sense of, of urgency, a very keen sense of urgency about tackling the kinds of problems that I think we now face. Because I think they are, they are proceeding at their own rate that's out of our current control. Um, to, to change and in many cases to get worse than they are now. And so the magnitude of the challenge is growing, not shrinking. And I think we have to be very mindful of that as we think about what solutions are possible. I think if you look at the projections, let's just take one example about global climate change. Many of those projections would say there is a window now of a very f short period of years in which one can hope to do something that would have a significant impact 20 years from now. And if we miss that window, then even if we do many more aggressive things after that window closes, we won't be able to avoid the problems. Now, I understand fully, I'm a scientist, that a lot of those are based on projections, that there are people who, who don't think that those projections are terribly accurate. But I think it is fair to say, I would say as a scientist, that the, the, the growing uh, body of evidence and expert analysis suggests that we uh, do have a problem, that that problem is getting worse, and that our time to deal with that problem is relatively short. And that's just one example. I think if we look at about the issues of energy development and sustainability, if we look at about the crisis of global uh, poverty, and, and food availability, if we look at those problems, if we ask ourselves how will we even deal with the needs for adequate water supplies for an increasingly urbanized world that's leaving the water supplies behind of the rural environment and congregating in cities where they're ever more inadequate in many parts of the world, how are we going to deal with that? That grows worse 
literally every day in the developing world as the developing world becomes increasingly urbanized. And I think my point is that we need to find solutions to those kinds of challenges sooner rather than later. And if we're going to do that sooner rather than later, then institutions of higher education who are going to prepare the students now, who are going to have to tackle those problems, the faculty of our institutions who can contribute now, partially at least, towards the solution of those problems, I would say need to have a sense of urgency about that. That's my point. And, uh, and I think your point about the fact that we need to be thorough, we need to be mindful of history, we need to learn from what history tells us. I would, I would agree with all of those points. I would just say, let's, not ma let's make sure we're not taking any more time than we need to. Let's not waste any of the time that's available to us because I'm, I'm concerned about in many of these areas that time is growing short. President Dooley, as uh, a recent grad, I can tell you it means a lot uh, to have you come up here uh, to see the presence of the President. Um, Rhode Island's been encountering some challenges. Uh, unemployment only 12.5%. As one of the states, even before the economic fallout, to have an uh, incredible deficit, there are obviously some financial challenges that the state has to deal with. I'm wondering what initiatives you are looking to implement. Uh, I know you mentioned stagnant economic perception students, parents, and the value you get for education. I know where I was recently voted as one of the top 15 value schools in the Northeast. Um, maybe what initiatives, what steps specifically are you looking to, uh, to put into place that will kind of pull people away from that perception of value that's solely related to dollars? Because um, I think that's going to be key, obviously, with the positive motion. Uh, that's a very good observation. I think, I think America has suffered and will continue to suffer from its response to, I think, the economic challenges that really the states have struggled with for the last couple of decades. I mean, if you look at the funding for public higher education over the last 20 years in state after state, the, the trend line has been downward. And that's as state after state struggles, on the one hand, with growing costs for certain essential services and stagnant revenues. Uh, that's, a, that's a major problem, and, and that's why we see whether you're in the Midwest, the Northeast, the Southeast, or the Far West, uh, public funding for higher education uh, has been, for the most part, on a downward cycle. What concerns me about that in terms of the, the future of our country is that's occurring precisely at a time when other countries of the world are investing heavily in higher education. I think part of the problem that we have as a nation is we, we, have both, we suffer from the weaknesses and benefit from the strengths of a decision made a long time ago that public higher education is going to be funded in America mostly on a state-by-state -state basis. In other words, the federal government provides research dollars that can be won in mostly competitive processes anywhere, and it provides direct aid to students. But it does not provide base operational support to higher education that's been left to the states. That's a, that's a different model from what most of the world actually uses. And it's a model of both strengths and weaknesses. And I think what we've been seeing over the last couple of decades, in fact, is one of the weaknesses of that model. And that's a challenge for all of us. Because, as I was saying to a couple of people earlier tonight, for, for higher, public higher education, for URI specifically, let's say, we need to look for that relatively small area of intersection where we can simultaneously be affordable and provide excess and high quality. And, and the, the, the volume of that little intersecting uh, uh, part of space, if you will, has been decreasing. And so finding the right balance point has become more difficult. Now, does that mean it's impossible? I don't. And there are a variety of approaches that I need to think we need to look at. One, I think we do need to have a dialogue in, very, in many states about the value of higher education as the best investment that state can make in its future. And they need to think of higher education not as a cost center, but as an investment. Frankly, students and families need to think of it the same way. It's an investment in their future. It's, it's, it's not something you're, you're buying but it is an investment. I think it is fair to talk about higher education as an investment in the future. 
And I think that's an important context and an important uh, way in which one can view higher education and think about what it means and think about how it should be structured. And I think we need to make that case even more forcefully now than we have in the past. But we also need to look at other ways in which higher education can succeed. Certainly we have to ask ourselves, can we do things more efficiently than we are now? And I think for some institutions of higher education, that's a more salient point than it is for others. The University of Rhode Island, like many, has learned how to do with less for quite some time, for all the reasons you pointed out. Um, other institutions are relatively new uh, to, to that kind of, of uh, situation. And so they, they may have more room to do things on the efficiency side than institutions like the University of Rhode Island might do. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't look at that. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't look for partners that will come in and help us think about our processes differently, how we go about business differently, and see if we can be more efficient. And URI is doing that. It also means that we need to talk to, uh, to folks who uh, have some control over the inefficiencies that are sort of handed to us. And I think that's one of the, the non-competitive things about Rhode Island, is the way in which many of its state practices are run and, and are transferred to the University of Rhode Island because it's, it's a state-funded entity in part, uh, are not best practices. I, I know of very few people who would defend some of the practices in the state of Rhode Island as being representative of the best practices that are out there in the business world or in, or in the world of science or engineering. I, I think they're far from it. And, and that's something that, in essence, doesn't cost new money to fix. It just takes the will to change what you've been doing for a long time and create an opportunity for you to be more innovative and, frankly, more entrepreneurial and more efficient, and those things go together. So I think that's all a part of it. The final thing I'll say is the University of Rhode Island in particular, I think, has many opportunities, many more than it's taken advantage of in the past, for partnering with other institutions and with the private sector, the public nonprofit sector, and with government. And I think we need to explore those. There are others who may wish to make investments in higher education if they see a very tangible return on the investment that they make. And they need to view URI as a responsive partner to them when they come with ideas, problems, and things that the university could help them with. And they may be willing to, to provide resources, both in kind and dollars, to help solve those problems. I saw a lot of this at Montana. When I was at Montana State, let me just comment on that, where Montana State in many ways functioned as the R&D arm of many small firms and businesses in the state and help make them successful by virtue of the fact that they could bring technical or business problems or scientific problems to the university. The university provide funding to the university actually to have people work on those problems. The university would solve those problems, give the answers uh, back to the company, and the company in a sense could then use the university and its students as its, its research and development operation very much a win-win proposition for both the institution and the company who otherwise would be looking at the, at the prospect of either not being able to do any research and therefore ultimately becoming uncompetitive, not being able to develop that research and becoming uncompetitive again, or having a cost-effective way to get that research and development done for them and benefit from the answers. And I think the University of Rhode Island can look at those kinds of opportunities, frankly, in Rhode Island and in the region. Just one example of the kind of partnerships that I would have in mind. You know, that, 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 is a, that is a very keen observation. I think much of what URI has to come to grips with is its own internal culture. I mean, like all institutions, 
Um, you get comfortable with certain ways of thinking, with certain approaches to solving problems, uh, with certain behaviors and practices. I think one of the advantages, and I'm not saying there are many advantages to economic times like we face now, but one of the advantages is it frequently can provide a, a context for you to look at what you're doing in a new way. And I think I sense a great willingness on the part of people at the University of Rhode Island to do that. In fact, one of the great attractions uh, for me coming to the university was this sense of an institution that recognized it needed to re-examine its culture, that recognized it probably needed to do things differently, that was actually hungry for the opportunity to do that, was actually looking for challenges to be laid out in front of it uh, to, to tackle some of the, the problems uh, that it faced. And more than that, looking for ways to, it could be challenged to think new, uh, to be challenged to innovate, to be challenged to really create something that didn't exist before. I, I had that sense of the institution uh, during the interview process and frankly it's been reinforced ever since I came that it is an institution that was in itself quite ready for that kind of, of transformational thinking. And that's one of the reasons it's such an exciting place to be right now. And in my conversations with faculty, in my conversations with dean, with university leaders, with staff, with students, uh, I, that feeling has been reinforced multiple times. And that gives me a great deal of optimism, frankly, that the culture of URI is such that it, it's ready to change. It's ready to innovate. It's ready to examine what it's doing, keep the things that it thinks will still work, change the things that won't work, create new things to try to see how they work, and to do that, as I said before, with a, with a, with a sense of urgency. And one of the things about the culture that I'm trying to communicate to people at URI is, look, let's not be afraid to fail. You know, there are a lot of folks out there who would say that a successful business, you know, the data would show, you know, you look at a company, an innovative company like a Hewlett Packard, and you ask how many ideas does Hewlett Packard generate that never make it into any products? The answer is a lot. But Hewlett Packard is a company that has always rewarded innovation and they, they haven't been afraid to fail at things. If they, they try an idea out and it doesn't work, they dump it. Well, I, I want to have the same kind of culture at the University of Rhode Island. Yeah, we want to try things because we think it'll help make our students more successful. We want to try things because it'll grow research activity. We want to try things because we th it'll think it'll help us engage and help those that we're trying to serve better. Well, we should be willing to try and to assess how well our efforts work and if they're not having the outcomes that we desire or they're not working as quickly then to change them or dump them and to not feel bad about that. I think that's part of innovation is that willingness to take some risks, that willingness to fail if needs be because you can learn from that and you just need to do that again on a time frame that enables you to keep moving forward and I think URI is ready to do that. I, I truly do, and that's one of the things I've been saying to the people is, look, let's, let's go out and set, let's try some things. Maybe the first two or three things we try that are really dramatically new in undergraduate education won't quite work as well as I or others think they do. Well, that's all right. What did we learn from that, and what other things can we try for our students? I think the students understand that, too, that if it's an institution that's focused on their success, that's trying to innovate ways to help them be even more successful, I think the students understand that, well, okay, I'm willing to be a participant in that experiment. I'm willing to be a partner in that experiment. I'll do my part to see if this is an idea that will actually help. And if it's not one that works in the way that we want, then let's try something else. Frankly, learning that is a great component of an undergraduate education. I think many of our students come out of college too afraid to fail. Uh, that's exactly right. Now, I, I learned this as a very early age, and, and I'll take a minute just to share, and I don't want to take too long, too much of your time. But I went, as a, as a young graduate student, I had one of those really critical moments where 
I went and I did an experiment. I actually had the privilege of going and, and, and participating in an experiment at the University of Rome. We got these, because they had a unique instrument to do this particular experiment, very much on the cutting edge. We did the experiment, we published the results. We published it in the premier journal of chemistry, the Journal of the American Chemical Society. Not only that, we published it as a communication. That is, a scientific paper of such urgency and importance that it was published, it was reviewed and published very rapidly. That was my first scientific publication. I was as pleased and as happy and as proud as I could be with that work. Well, about a year later, I get, I get a contact. We get a contact from a, a new company in San Diego that had built a new generation of the kind of instrument that we had used in Rome. They wanted us to come down since we had done these cutting edge experiments and try the experiment on their instrument and see if their instrument performed better than the one that existed at the University of Rome because they wanted to market it and sell it. They needed a real world test. So we went down and did that. I went down and I made those measurements. One of those times in a graduate student, you know, you're up for 72 consecutive hours. Uh, you can barely stand at the end of the day. But I had the data. I got a few hours sleep and drove back to Pasadena from San Diego. And I was crushed, absolutely crushed. Because I had done the experiment enough to know that the experiment that we had done previously had to be wrong. So my first scientific publication was wrong. It was a mistake, and it was an extremely prominent mistake that had gotten a lot of attention, had been cited already, you know, my PhD advisor had given talks about it, and it was just dead wrong. And fortunately, I'd been the one to discover it. I proved it myself that it was dead wrong. And so I came into my advisor, who didn't know at that point that it was dead wrong, showed him the data, showed him my analysis, said, you know, we're wrong, the, the, the old paper's wrong, this is right. He looked at it, he agreed with me completely. And, I, and he could tell I was crushed. So he did a very important thing for me. He went over to his filing cabinet and he dug out a paper and he showed it. It was a paper that he had published as a young professor at Columbia University. And he says, this was one of my first papers. He says, and it was dead wrong. And he says, and worse than that, it was a professor at Harvard who proved it. <laughs> And, and I look, just looked at him, and because he was one of the most, he's, he still is, he's one of the most eminent, eminent scientists in America, winner of the Presidential Medal for Science, a member of the National Academy of Science, uh, you know, a, a possible winner of the Nobel Prize in the relatively near future. He's one of the best of the best. And so it was, in a certain sense, heartening to me that he had made a mistake, but that really still didn't get the message across, and you could tell that didn't get the message across. And he, so he looked me in the eye and he says, Dave, you need to realize Unless you're willing to risk failure, you'll never do anything important. And that, I think, is true. Yes, sir. Thanks for the question. I, I, I can share with you what I've, I've now shared with the, with the faculty of uh, Human Science and Services and with, and with the deans and with the department chairs in the, in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'll share with more groups as I get around to them. Um, I can't remember if I, I, no, I did share it with the College of Pharmacy faculty as well. Here, here's my thought on that. Let's think about how we would organize the undergraduate curriculum around the grand challenges and not in terms of colleges and disciplines. I'm not saying that we do away with colleges and disciplines and departments. Not at all. What I'm saying is let's think about how we put a curriculum together that says if you're a young person and you want to make a difference in the world and you want to contribute to new energy development or you want to contribute to public health and solving the problems of infectious disease or you want to contribute to solving the problems around climate change, well, 
here's the program of study that will prepare you for that future at URI. Here are the courses, and they may be courses in engineering, they may be in courses in sociology and political science and economics and business, physics and chemistry and what have you. Here they are, here are your options. If you want to work on the public policy side, here's a curriculum for you that may involve multiple colleges and multiple departments. If you want to work on the scientific side, the technological side of solving these kinds of problems, because I think there's going to be a component to that in both energy and global climate change. Well, here's a curriculum for you. And I think thinking about how to organize our curriculum around those grand challenges would provide for undergraduates, one, the gratification, the motivation of being intimately involved right from the get-go of being prepared to make a difference in the world. No longer are they studying physics, even though it's a wonderful discipline, purely for the benefit of knowing physics. They're studying physics because ultimately it's going to be extremely important to them and their aspirations to make a difference in the world in some area that they would like to make a difference in. And there are studies that suggest the new generations of students are students who are more motivated by that than past generations of students have been. Well, let's take advantage of that. Let's harness that interest, that energy, that motivation in ways that enable them to be energized about what they're doing as undergraduates, leave URI prepared to make a difference in the world because, and enthusiastic about their prospects of doing so because they feel that they've had an opportunity to get started towards their life's work. And I think that's really worth having a look at. That doesn't mean we don't have, as I said, that doesn't mean we don't have colleges and departments. It's still important to study physics for physics and philosophy for philosophy. But students will have the opportunity to do that in a context of preparing themselves to make a difference in the world in the way that they want to. And I think that's a very, very useful way to think about organizing how we teach undergraduates and the subjects that they may be asked to take. So that's my thought. If you have another idea, I'd be glad to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've laid out in front of the deans and I've gotten some good ideas back about that and, and I've, frankly I've gotten some very positive responses to that kind of notion amongst, amongst the faculty because I think a lot of faculty realize intrinsically that some of the most interesting problems, the most interesting unanswered questions, the most interesting things to, to think creatively about sit out there in the intersections of all kinds of disciplines that maybe 15 or 25 years ago didn't look connected at all. Anything else? Well, thanks everybody for a lot for being here. Uh, we encourage everyone to uh, please feel free to uh, talk with President uh, Dooley and Lynn Baker Dooley afterwards because uh, they both are here to meet, uh, to meet our alumni. And we've told them uh, what a great alumni we have at the University of Rhode Island, so we want you to have a chance to, uh, to show them that. Before we uh, leave, a couple people I, I want to introduce uh, <clears throat> for special reasons. First of all, uh, Nick Shigas, who is our alumni chapter leader here in Boston. And, uh, <clears throat> Nick and his uh, colleagues are doing a great job in keeping our, our Boston alumni group very vital, and we really appreciate that, Nick. We also have some representatives here from the university. Uh, the president's been talking about he's laying out his agenda with the deans, and three of the deans uh, are here this evening. Uh, Winnie Brunell, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> Ray Wright, Dean of the College of Engineering. and Nancy Faye Jensen, who is the Interim Dean of the College of Environmental Life Sciences. And they came up because they wanted to hear more about the President's agenda, right? We also have uh, Michelle Nada, who is our Director of Alumni Relations. And representing the University of Rhode Island Foundation is Lori Onanian. Tom Zorbedian, who works with Dean Brunell. <laughs> Michaela Mooney, who works in the College of Business Administration. And, and Robert Clough, who works with Dean Wright. 
Now, if you've enjoyed this evening's program, and I, I'm sure you have, um, all the credit goes to Paul Witham and his staff, and I don't know where Paul went, but he, there he is in the back, <laughs> who planned this. And I also want to acknowledge John Peterson and his staff because they're the uh, gurus behind all of this uh, great electronic communication that we're doing. And uh, what we do, you know, is uh, us people who've been around a little bit in higher ed, uh, you just hire young people who know all this modern technology and they'll do it for you. Anyway, uh, thanks again, everyone, uh, for coming this evening. Uh, the president has been very eager to, uh, to come up here and do this because he does want to get around and see our alumni as well as uh, Lynn Baker Dooley does. So thank you very, very much and uh, have a safe trip home.